The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to this Gold Money Foundation podcast with me, your host, Andy Duncan. Uh, Again, I'm in Auburn, Alabama at the Mises Institute. And today I'm speaking to the historian, Tom Woods. Hello, Tom. Hi, Andy. Now, you did a great speech yesterday. It was on why greenbackers are wrong. Now, we've associated greenbackers with the end of Fed movement because they they kind of want to end the Federal Reserve too. So can you tell us why you think greenbackers are wrong? Right. Well, the greenbackers are people who will will tell you as soon as they suspect that you may have some misgivings about the current monetary system that you should go watch a video called The Money Masters or they've got all these videos you should watch and, you know, there may be 30% of it that's pretty good, but by and large, the prescription they have is that we need to get rid of the Fed so that we can have a more direct government f- uh, form of money creation and not have this private banking system that we have now. Now, of course, this is a, a, a libel on the private sector to call the current banking system a private banking system or to think that the problems with our banking system is that it isn't socialistic enough, which is implicitly what the greenbackers are saying. And they expect us to have this sort of naive confidence in the political class. So, of course, that's wrong. I, I, I hardly think this is even, some, is even debatable. But they, I was even going into some of the more detailed aspects of their claims because they, they've been making these claims for decades. Uh, Gary North has answered them, but very few people have actually bothered to answer them because they have no real base, they're, they're not in academia, they have no influence, so why bother? I think it's worth bothering because they do bring along a lot of otherwise, I think, decent folks who might be conspiratorial in, conspiratorially inclined, and so they hear this and they think, aha, the banks are in conspiracy against us, we need the great public servants of ours to be in charge of the money, which it seems to me... Why don't they think conspiratorially about those people? I don't know. But the, one of the arguments they make, and we don't need to go into the details, but is that when you have a system like ours where the banks create the money, uh, for example, the commercial banks create money when you go to borrow $1,000, they just ding their computers and they give you a passbook with $1,000 listed on it. And they create that out of thin air, but that's a loan that they create to you. And so all the money is created in the form of loans, so they lend you $1,000. But when you go to repay that $1,000, they never created the $100 in interest that you owe. So their, their argument is the banks enslave us because they create enough money for the principal of the loan, but they don't create enough money to pay the interest. And this is, this is they want it this way. They, they want us to default so that they can then come in and confiscate our collateral and all that. So... I just thought enough's enough. Enough decent people have been taken in by this. So at my website, TomWoods.com, I set up a page where you can read my response to the Greenbackers. It's just TomWoods.com slash paper. And of course, I meant by paper, I meant here's my paper I'm giving at the conference. But I guess I also mean paper because that's their solution to the monetary <laughs> problem. <Yeah. laughs> Now, in a country, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm English, so I, America's not my history at all. But uh, even I know that uh, you have this thing called the Continental from the Continental War when um, you you, uh, you let the king and the queen go and everything else. Now, with, with a country which has a phrase such as not worth a continental, how do these greenbackers think that the, the money supply will be controlled once it's uh, given to the government completely? Well, that's a good question. I mean, they have what I think are sort of contrived answers to all historical episodes that you might raise against them to the contrary. So for the Continental, they claim that well, that was debased only because of British counterfeiting. It had oh. nothing to do with the policy. And yet you can see how, how quickly the issues of the Continental multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. So I, I'm not inclined to buy that explanation. But I haven't found... I mean, the, I, it could be my fault. But the, honestly, the best that I can think of as a greenbacker response in terms of something that I've heard them say is that, well, when... No system is perfect, but at least if our public servants are in charge of the money, then we've got some kind of control over them. We have no control over the Federal Reserve. So if they go off the rails, we'll make sure and 
and and and, and rein them in. And I, I feel like saying, well, how did that work on the bailouts that nobody favored, but yet nevertheless went through? How did we rein them in on that one? And secondly, who says the American public would want to rein in inflation necessarily? Yeah, they don't like high prices, but if they associate it, uh, reining in inflation with uh, reining in uh, Medicare and Social Security, you know, they won't favor that. So. I, I think their assurances are rather on the naive side. Yeah, now you explain quite nicely how in 1933, um, when the American government took all the gold and, and, and gave people paper notes back and then exchanged dollars for it, those dollars weren't debt-based. But surely if you're against debt-based money, um, you should move towards a free market money such as gold. Right, and when they talk about debt-based money, they're talking about exactly what I said earlier, where in our system the money enters the economy when banks... Uh, issue loans to people, and and because because the commercial banks can't create dollar bills in the U.S., but what they can do is create these electronic accounts, and they say, "Here's your thousand uh, dollar," and people go and write checks on this thousand dollars. But that's a debt; it's it's a loan from the bank to somebody, and their argument is that, as I said, they we can't repay all these debts because there isn't enough money to repay the interest. So we need money that isn't in any way encumbered by debt, that has no connection to debt whatsoever. And what I was arguing in my paper is, well, then free market and money is exactly what you want. Because when on the free market, when money is created like any other commodity, when gold is mined and then minted into coins and spent into the economy, where's the loan involved? And There's no loan there. There's no debt there. That's just spending the money into the economy. So it seems like this way, you don't need the, the so-called private bankers, and you don't need Nancy Pelosi or John McCain. This, would be, this should be like a greenbacker's dream. This is your debt-free money. But if what you want is inflation more than you want debt-free money, then you won't like that solution. So wh why, why do they want this inflation? Why, why do they think that this paper money will be a good thing? Well, when you look at what their political outlook is, uh, of course, there's a variety of perspectives, but by and large, they tend to be people uh, who supported, who, who would have supported Franklin Roosevelt, who would have supported Alexander Hamilton in U.S. history, uh, people who uh, favored a, a powerful government, and but who were perceived, at least in FDR's case, who were perceived as acting in the interests of the public against the, uh, you can't say this for Hamilton, but uh, acting in the interests of the public against the, the wealthy fat cats, and they tend to believe that this is how you, you create full employment. This is how you put people to work. You can't rely on the free market to resolve these things. But they honestly believe that, if, and, and again, I, you don't have to take my word for it. If you look up Ellen Brown, she basically believes that full employment can be brought about uh, uh, by inflation and that our problem is not scarcity. We have conquered scarcity. The only scarcity we have is a scarcity of money. And if, if we had more money, we could grease the skids of more transactions, more people would be put to work. I mean, it is like a perpetual motion machine that they, they think they can create simply with inflation. It is a, it is a utopian view. And, it, and being a utopian view, it's not something that you can debate using economic theory. Yeah. One of my favorite novels is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love that. Oh, that. You've got series. the Golga Fringians who, uh, who, who land on Earth, and uh, they think they've got a problem with money, so they declare leaves as legal tender. And then they start burning down all of the forests to limit the money supply, which I think is hilarious. Okay, so let, let's assume that we've, uh, we've, uh, we've, we've, we've persuaded all of the greenbackers and all the people who believe in government paper money to come to our side. How do we move then, do you think, to a proper free market money? Well, I think the way you do it is one step at a time, and it has to be through a gradual series of steps, especially because if you're going to make a, cha a change of this import dealing with something that everybody uses then and 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 considering also that the vast majority of the public doesn't realize there is really a problem with the money has never thought about money has never thought about where money comes from what its purpose and most people don't even remotely give this a second thought to suddenly radically change this uh, without the public on board is probably impossible so the way you have to do it is introduce it gradually by getting people to at least acknowledge and realize that some people want to use other ways of transacting. They want to use other media of exchange. So you, you remove all, all obstacles in the path of alternative monies. So in the U.S., for example, there are uh, contractual limits on, because we have legal tender laws, you can't contract with somebody and say, you must pay me in gold, because they are always 
uh, free to pay you in, in in the in U.S. dollars because that's legal tender. You're uh, no country, no contract to the country uh, can take away the fact that you are obligated to accept the legal tender of the country. So there are contractual restrictions on 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 uh, on uh, having transactions in other currencies, and then there are taxes of various kinds on other currencies. So we get rid of all those, and and then we get rid of the legal tender laws. And again, that sounds like an extreme measure to some people too, but you just explain that to people by saying, well, isn't this a free country? We put them on the defense. Isn't this a free country? Why, why should, if the dollar is such a great thing, which most people when faced with change will say, well, what's wrong with the dollar? I use it all the time. If it's so great, why does it need monopoly protection? It'll survive on its own. And so just one layer at a time, you get people using other things. And you, and you say to people, if you want to keep using the depreciating dollar, you go right ahead. But the rest of us who might want to have something more stable, we ought to be free to do that. And then you just see in the free marketplace of money what people tend to prefer. And over time, as as one layer of government support after another is removed, then you get closer to a, a free market solution. Yeah. So one of these first steps has to then be, if you want to get the public on your side, a kind of education process. Now, you're doing great work there with uh, with speeches around the country and so on. And you're doing things in Iowa, I believe. Can, can you tell us what you're doing in Iowa? Oh, this is fun. Yeah, so in Iowa, I, obviously your listeners know who Ron Paul is. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, we're all uh, skeptical of the political parties and everything. But in Iowa, which is a real battleground state politically in the U.S., the Republican Party in that state has basically been taken over completely by the Ron Paul people. From uh, the, the top people are all Ron Paul. The people, they're all people who ran his campaign. And so what they want to do is have a series of events around Iowa where our kind of liberty message is brought to the grassroots average Iowa Republican. And the way they want to do this is have these events be events where I – like, for example, we're doing one uh, next month. It's going to be a three-hour event and several people will be involved, but I'm going to speak three times. That's the key of the event is I'm speaking three times. And as – the topics go on, they get more challenging and more um, more challenging to their existing worldview. Yeah. So I'm going to start off with the economy, but I'm not going to give the usual Republican boilerplate about we need lower taxes. Well, you know, no kidding. <laughs> I want to talk about the Fed. I want to talk about the bailouts that all these Republicans who believe in the free market were all telling us we had to support. You can't be a free market purist and the, you know, the, the, there are no atheists in foxholes, and there are no free marketeers during a crisis, and all that. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, look, either either we're we're free marketeers or we're not. Either we're cronies or we're capitalists. So I'm going to give them a totally different. I'm going to say, if you really want the free market, don't vote for Newt Gingrich for heaven's sake, right? Then the second thing will be the the topic of state nullification of federal laws, which is gaining traction in the U.S. And then finally. Those two topics, I will have them cheering. I guarantee you I'll have them cheering. I wouldn't have Newt cheering. I feel like cheering now. <laughs> I appreciate that. But these are like the average person in the Republican Party in, in Iowa. They, they kind of feel like that's what their party stands for. Then the third speech will be on foreign policy. And that's where I take all the capital I've built up with them and I blow it in and one half it. an hour speech. <laughs> right. But I think I can explain it to them in a way that they will walk away thinking, at the very least, they'll think, I need to give this some thought, at the very least. That's good. Do you think, then, that you're going to be approached to become a politician yourself? Do you think that you'll be asked to stand for being a senator? (laughs) This happens to me every day. (laughs) This happens constantly. I'm getting this all the time. But and what's your response? Are you going to do it? No, I. Have, but first, I just I don't have any interest in doing it, and it would require an absolutely enormous commitment of time, which is very hard to do when you're a guy with four kids and the oldest is nine. Yeah, I don't want to do it to them. But secondly, I I just don't want to have to. I'm not the sort of person who would weigh my every word. I would say what I think, and if I said what I thought, I would get no votes. Mm-hmm. Even people who think they want to support me wouldn't vote for me. And then also, I would be called all kinds of, I'm an extremist, and look, he doesn't even favor this, he doesn't, and you know, I, I, I'm, just not, I, I, I'm just not doing that. I have too much of a paper trail, and I think I'd have to spend too many of my resources running around defending myself all the time. I think it would be a waste of, of decent yeah. people's money. So I, I'm rather, I'd rather stay on the sidelines, do what I'm doing there. It's amazing, isn't it, how, how Ron Paul found the energy over those many decades to, to do what he did. Yeah, and he, when, now, of course, he was flying under the radar for a long time. But after 2007, 
He, he had many, many people who loved him, would crawl over broken glass for him, but then he also attracted enemies of a, of a degree of nastiness that I'm sure he had never encountered in his career. And yet he handled that with dignity and grace. He ne- never let it bother him. He just carried on because he, was a sh- he had that assurance that for every one of these people who would insult him, there were a hundred cheering him. Yeah. Now, I, I want you to be spared as well from politics so you can write more books. Now, oh, my, my favorite book of yours was, uh, well, I've read quite a few of them, is, is Meltdown. Oh, thanks. Um, which came out within 10 seconds of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of the economy melting down. So that was good. It was quick off the mark. Yeah. But there were some great things on there, such as the 1921 Depression, which never happened because the Federal Reserve didn't do anything. You're right. It? Yeah, until after the NBER said that it had already yeah. stopped. Yeah. Now, um, do you think that we're, where do you think we are in the current meltdown? Do you think we're still bouncing along the bottom or are we going to go even further down or, 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 or where are we in, in the current meltdown? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, it, it's true that we've seen the Dow Jones reaching these so-called record levels nominally, but it's worth remembering what the strategy of the Federal Reserve has been since the Greenspan years. When we look at the, at the stock market, we should remember a point that David Stockman makes in his forthcoming book, which you should, you should read this mm-hmm. and have him on because it's called The Great Deformation. It's a huge book, but you will love this book. I have a pre-publication copy. Mm-hmm. Just the first three chapters completely dismantle all the arguments for the bailouts yeah. that you've ever heard. Now, I, I did that a little bit in, in, in Meltdown, but but he, David Stockman makes me look like a lazy bum. And he worked for the Reagan. He worked in the Reagan administration. Yeah. He's extremely smart. Um, so, well, all, all the same. Um what he points out in that book is that the Fed has been aiming at what it calls the, what's called the wealth effect. What we'll try to do is gin up the stock market so that wealthy investors feel wealthier. Yeah. And because they feel wealthier, they'll be inclined to borrow more and to spend more. This will stimulate economic activity. Now, notice this is not a free market approach it's all at all. the wrong way around, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Right. So they're trying to manipulate. And what they want is are, are these metrics by which they can say, look at how wonderfully the Fed has managed the economy. I mean, employment is high, uh, the stock market is high. So when the stock market is high, I just think, well, the Fed is engaged in the wealth effect again. And when you look at what were the actual results of Fed policy, you look at the key boom years, you look at 2000 and 2007, what is fascinating is that even though population, of course, grew during those years, the number of net breadwinner jobs created during those years was zero. Oh, wow. So, it's, I mean, if, if, you, if you really want a statistic that shows you how phony their manipulation is, there it is. But meanwhile, Greenspan was getting all the credit because look at the growth and look at all these figures. Yeah, they, play, they, they make sure that those figures look good. But the average guy is not benefiting from this. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how uh, they can get away with such things. Do you have any uh, more books coming out soon at all? I don't right now, uh, simply because I'm working on a, a huge project. I have two big projects that are super important to me. One is a website I started last year called libertyclassroom.com, where I teach courses and other people I trust teach, like Austrian economics, U.S. history, all that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to add a course on Keynesianism. Oh. What are the errors of Keynes and what are the correct views of the Austrians? Yeah. So th- that's the sort of thing you can learn in your car sort of thing. So that's my libertyclassroom.com. But the other thing is I am working on a kindergarten through grade 12 homeschool curriculum oh, wow. that will be basically from our sort of point of view. But not just – it won't just be that kids who take this will have a real knowledge of money and, and, and all that stuff. They will. But they will also be trained in public speaking. They will all have a blog. They'll all have a YouTube channel. Yeah. They will, they'll be able not, they won't just have this information sitting vainly in their heads. They will be, have the skills to go out there and uh, proselytize for these ideas. Yeah. So it's not going to be so much Khan Academy as a kind of Woods Academy. It should be, uh, should be Woods Well, Academy. there'll be another person's name attached to it that I can't announce just now. But, but, but you should – I have a, a letter, woodsletter.com. I send out a free letter every month, and I'll be making the announcement there. But this is the most exciting because I think the most long – in terms of the long term, potentially life-changing sort of thing. That If, if you could get – I think it, this project – will take at least tens of thousands of American kids out of the government schools and equip them 
with knowledge and skills yeah. that are going to make our movement much, much stronger in the future. That's great. Fantastic work that you're doing. Um, now, we've got other lectures going on today, such as Professor Salerno and things, what we both probably want to go and see. So it's been great you give me your time today. Oh, Thank my you very pleasure, much. Andy. Tom Woods. Anytime. Thanks. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.